2022 and episode eight, where today we talk about how Africa shaped the architecture of the world economy and the relevance to a brand Africa. So what have we covered so far? You see, the last two uh, segments, we focused on brand Africa because we argued that um, we have to rebrand around modernizing rather than westernizing Africa, the current brand is is damaged it 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 positions africa as a, a, a people with no history no greatness uh, behind them it, it actually looks at africa as some kind of last frontier uh, for development therefore opening africa for exploitation or maybe even recolonization so we argued for a brand africa that is refreshed radiates its past greatness and exudes readiness for wealth creation, not continued poverty reduction and humanitarian aid. It's a brand that actually gives a telescopic vision of what Africa is, will be economic superpower in the world. And we did provide evidence that even at mediocre economic growth rates, 4 to 6%, much lower than China and India did, Africa will still be the largest economy by 2060. So there's no problem there. But with an enhanced brand Africa, that economic growth rate will be even faster as our manufactured finished goods and services become more attractive to the rest of the world. So today in episode eight, we focus on another misconception around brand Africa, and that is to the impression that Africans have contributed very little to human progress. So we're going to go straight into that uh, and, and start looking at the facts shortly. So my name is Mandivamba Rukuni. I authored this book, being African, which I'm recommending to you, you stand a chance of winning a copy of this book in the DWP competitions. But I wrote this book primarily because we Africans often confuse westernization with modernization. So this book goes through what it takes for us to modernize Africa using our heritage rather than westernizing it. So Wunu, Botu, Ubuntu, Udubu is what this book is about. I recommend it to you highly, and those who want the practical side of how to succeed using heritage values, you can go to the small handbook of uh, African Pathways to Success. Look forward to you participating in the competition. Thank you. Stand a chance to win a copy of the book, Being African, or the booklet, African Pathways to Success, by subscribing to our YouTube channel, Dialogue with Prof. Mandi Rukuni and leaving a comment on one of our recent videos. You can also like our Facebook page and comment on a recent post. If you're on Instagram, follow the profile Prof Manduru Kuni and leave a comment on a recent post as well. A random participant will be chosen at the end of the month and will be contacted and given the book. Most of us Africans are not analyzing this, these facts. So when I say today's world economy was actually shaped by Africa's contribution to it, <laughs> you may tend not to believe it because you haven't looked at the facts, you haven't looked at the history. That's why it is important to go through this fact. So fact number one, before slavery, 
and before colonization, Africa already had very advanced societies, advanced all the way socially, economically, politically. So here, I'm going to rely totally on uh, just one book. There are many uh, publications out there which chronicle and explain Africa's contributions. But the one I chose for, for you, uh, the one I found to be just right, is the book by, uh, by Jeff uh, Pierce entitled The Gifts of Africa, subtitled How a Continent and Its People Changed the World. So I'm going to run through a few of the examples in there which show pre-slavery and pre-colonization, some of Africa's contributions. The rest of my talk today will then focus on post-slavery slavery and colonization. But Jeff talks about Zira Jacob, this Ethiopian in the 16th century, whose philosophical works have been compared to those of Rene Descartes, just back in the 16th century. And Jeff Pierce goes through to demonstrate how many nations in Africa, all the way from Somalia, all the way down Zimbabwe, to Zimbabwe, uh, these nations were trading with the East, especially China, well before slavery and colonization. There's also a nice anecdote in the book where Jeff gives an example of the Liberian um, thinker, activist, Edmund Wilmore Blyden, who actually deeply, deeply influenced Marcus Gavi the Great when it comes to Pan-Africanism. He also, I mean, Jeff also goes to profile other more recent innovators, to name a few, Papa Suso from Gambia, a renowned global economist from Ghana, George Aitei. The book chronicles history of the Nubians and all the way down to today where we see modern artists, superstars, Nigerians, uh, in painting and so on, global, globally uh, uh, renowned uh, uh, sculptors from Zimbabwe. Um, and did you know that Malcolm X, Malcolm X was heavily influenced by the Mau Mau in Kenya? A and that shaped his, his view about liberation. So this, this is a great book uh, that I, uh, I propose you engage with. It's bold, it's engaging, it really uh, takes you through the greatness of Africa. Fact number two, Africa's contribution to the global economy was and is phenomenal. We've already in past sessions talked about how the rest of the industrialized world literally is, is, is uh, 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 debtors to Africa when it comes to resources. But just to show Africa's contribution uh, at its height, I have to go back to slavery in the United States. And you know, one of the uh, most amazing contradictions in modern day society comes from what I consider to be the most famous words by the American founding fathers when they talked about unalienable rights of all people to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So tell me, how could be these great people with such deep values, passionate about them in fact, how could they then maintain a brutal practice of human bondage? How could they, in spite of believing in liberty, you know, in spite of believing in life and pursuit of happiness, how could they then live in peace consistent with this practice of owning slaves as personal property. So 
This was so, this contradiction was so deep that it did not only lead to the American Revolution, the Civil War in the 1860s, but slavery survived the Civil War. It continued uh, in various forms, even after slavery, and its effects reverberate up to today. Uh, therein, actually, uh, are, 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 are the beginnings of my story today. Therein lies the tale of how Africa and African slaves contributed to present-day architecture of the world economy. Because these slaves provided not just labor power, they were providing labor power in what at the time were British colonies, because the U.S. was part of the British colonies. But the products that were produced by slaves, especially in the south of the U.S., are products that became mega value chains throughout the industrial world, and some of them still are, such as tobacco, sugar, coffee, cocoa, and, and probably the biggest became cotton because of its significance for manufacturing. But so is sugar up until today. So although within the U.S. slavery started uh, in the beginnings of the 17th century uh, when uh, the British colonists brought slaves into Virginia, but slavery grew pretty fast into the South. And um, as I say, you know, uh, the economy trumps uh, human freedom. Uh, slavery became in almost all British colonies, uh, slavery was morally, legally, and socially acceptable. Um, and because of the massive growth in, in, these, in these mega value chains, like I say, especially sugar, uh, cotton, tobacco, uh, they, they, this fueled uh, the growth of the economies in Europe, especially the United Kingdom, uh, through manufacturing and, and, and service jobs. So that, that meant that the demand for labor grew faster now in the UK and Europe and less available in the, in, in the Americas. And that then meant acceleration in the importation of slaves as lab labor. So when it comes to industry itself, Slaves already had skills in metallurgy, tool making. I mean, it's not like they came with no skills. Most people don't realize that. They did have some pre-industrial skills. And when they got there, they were at the forefront of getting these machines to work, the steam engines. They literally uh, would re invent and reinvent some of the tools such as chisels, saws, you know, and, and support nails, name it. So. They also brought with them some knowledge around, uh, especially astrology, understanding the heavens and how they operate and how they impact on the environment, on, on people uh, and crops, uh, basic uh, uh, medicines, especially African-style herbal medicines, uh, which, which helped a lot uh, during early stages of uh, colonization of the Americas. I mean, they could navigate rivers. Uh, after all, you know, the, the canoe was discovered in, 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 in Africa. So this is the thing. I mean, they could tra tra trap animals for food. Uh, there's quite a, f a lot of those kinds of inventions. But I also recommend uh, for you um, a, 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 a small publication by uh, Tasia. I think it's Ericeren, uh from California State University. It's a nice little publication, just shows some of the inventions by uh, African-Americans to show how they were key uh, at home and in the field and in the factory. I ran through some of them quickly. I mean, the blood bank was created by an African-American, Dr. Charles Richard Drew in 1904. Uh, to 1950, he was born. George Washington Carver was a, 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 another great uh, uh, inventor, a, invented different products uh, from crops, from peanuts, sweet potatoes, uh, soy products, etc. The, 
potato chip, which is still a global big uh, product, was invented by George Crumb, an African-American. A nice little story of how he created, actually. The mailbox, as the Americans got to know it, there was was invented by an African-American. The gas mask, African-American. The folding cabinet beds, African-American. You know, the incandescent light bulb, African-American, uh, Lewis Howard Latimer. The steam engine lubricator, uh, Elijah McCoy. The traffic signal, which is still today uh, indispensable in society, invented by African-American, Garrett Augustus Morgan. Um, many beauty uh, uh, and hair care products uh, on the masking tape, clear adhesive tapes, the many inventions by African-Americans. Thirdly, I go to the commercialization of many industrial crops that started and originated in Africa that you may not even know today that they were originally African because they're now all over the world and mega commercial products in the United States. Watermelon, coffee, Cola, uh, rooibos tea today, uh, oil palm, uh, shea, or shea butter, cow peas, also known as black eyed pea in the US, okra, yams, uh, leafy greens, you know, rice, sorghum, millet, spell millet, finger millet, teff, and folio. All these products originated from Africa. And for those of you who are scientists, especially in uh, crop, uh, husbandry, uh, crop breeding and physiology uh, uh, experts, you will know that for each and every crop that has gone all over the world and done successful, it's great for the world. But the center of origin in this case would be Africa. And that means a lot in terms of the uh, eventual ge gen genetic diversity of uh, that crop range as the land races become important in keeping everything with the possibility of regaining longevity. Fourthly, we go into the social and cultural uh, revolution that African Americans took to, to the United States. I mean, African influence on American culture is just phenomenal. From how people worship, how families are organized, you know, music, food, language, uh, name it, these are important contributions to, to, to American life, uh, which is eventually became the largest commercial uh, nation in the world. I mean, they, they, and that also meant that a lot of the trades and the skills had come along with that. So if we go to music alone, which is, of course, uh, many people's favorite topics. I mean, but we, let's go back into the history. But for slaves, music was the way they would express their feelings, you know, whether it was sorrow, joy, you know, uh, hope, inspiration. And, and uh, 17th, 18th century, the, the, those uh, songs, uh, those musical themes would be passed down to generations. Eventually, that's what translated into what we call Negro spirituals today. But after the revolution, after that uh, war of the 1860s, and more and more slaves were free, uh, and they would move to safer towns, you know, they, 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 Quite a few of them were employed uh, for various jobs, including actually uh, a lot of them were employed in uh, army and, and, and police bands, where they then created a distinctive type of music, uh, you, you know, uh, ragtime music, which translated into jazz. But generally speaking, the uh, the, 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 you, could, you could look at all genres of music today. I mean, whether it's pop, jazz, R&B, gospel, hip hop, house, folk, disco. I mean, those can all be traced back to black musicians. As a matter of fact, there would not be any MTV today 
created in 1980, there would be no MTV around early 80s anyway, without that African beat, which led to all this music. So just to point out that it was African-Americans who invented some of those early instruments, such as the banjo and the fiddle. I mean, so including the harmonica, which was uh, invented by DeFord Bailey, an African-American. So, I mean, they, they, I was looking at um, Black History Month's list of uh, playlist of the greatest black musicians of all time. And I tell you, it's, uh, it's just amazing. I mean, on their list, uh, right at the number one, Little Richard, uh, you know, 1932 to 2020, he passed on. Chuck Berry, the greatest guitarist of his time. James Brown, you know, with Papa and, you know, has got a brand new bag. Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, of course, and Louis Armstrong are all in the top five, six. And, uh, and my own all-time favorite, Jimi Hendrix, is, 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 is in there. I mean, the greatest guitarist that ever walked the earth uh, who probably won't have another one even close. Same thing with sports. I don't even bother going through uh, 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 a long list, but you know uh, that the greatest sports persons of all time in a lot of the fields were African-American. You could put the top five boxers in the world of all time would all be African-Americans. You know, even in sports where African Americans were in minorities, I mean, and Arthur Ashe was greatest uh, 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 tennis player. You know, uh, Tiger Woods today. You know, uh, 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 you no, know, you had if you go into basketball, which was actually a creation of the African Americans. You have, I mean, I, I, I can't even name them. Uh, from Michael Jordan and all these younger ones that I've lost touch with. Major global impact, socially, culturally, economically, uh, I, I, I can tell you. So, if going back to, uh, therefore, what this all means, I'll come back in a few minutes with the analysis of all these facts that I'm giving you. What does it mean in the way Africa and African slaves actually were part of a major architecture of present-day global economy. So I'll see you back here shortly. Thank you. So welcome back, and let's analyze these facts, um, which were all uh, to do with Africa and African Americans' contribution to the world economy. So let's let's go to the heart of what I'm talking about when I say architecture of the world economy. So you go back at the height of slavery and focus on the southern states the southern states became the economic engine of this new burgeoning nation. The southern states became the basis of what was going to be the United States of America as the next economic superpower after the United Kingdom. Okay, let's analyze further how that happened. So these enslaved workers, were basically the most significant investment of, 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 the, of the plantations. So if you were a plantation owner, as an example, and this table was your plantation, and you had uh, 200 slaves, those 200 slaves were personal possessions with a financial value which could be securitized with the banks. That was actually... <laughs> collateral security. So with, with that kind of balance sheet, 
that started transforming even the way banks collateralized investment in the South. So that confederacy of the Southern states, if you look at the figures, as we, as the United States was going into the uh, Civil War of 1860s, the confederacy, uh, 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 if it was going to be looked at as a separate nation, would have been the fourth uh, richest economy in the world. Okay, so in the South, this, this was the center of cotton industry for the world. The Confederacy produced 75% of all cotton grown in the world at that time. You just see the impact it had on the manufacturing industry, on the textile industry and beyond. And because it's it, uh, owning slaves and being able to push cotton, of course, and the other crops, sugar, tobacco, and so on. But the South, the southern states is where the first major sprouting of millionaires happened in the United States. Per capita, they had more millionaires in the Mississippi River Valley than anywhere else in the United States. And as I say, that's the beginning of the contribution of African slaves to the architecture of the world. We'll come back to that again in a minute. But I want to throw this in before I get there, and that is the key thing that still worries Africans and the rest of the world. That in Western civilization, economic necessity trumps morality all the time. They always pretend they are more morally upright than Africans and the rest of the world. But in actual fact, slave labor, it becomes so entrenched in the South that nothing would dislodge it not even the Civil War. So, I said it earlier, the Founding Fathers crafted the Constitution around what they called unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but they could not get rid of slavery. Not even the belief that all men are created equal according to Abraham Lincoln. That could not get rid of slaves either. It took much longer, well beyond the Civil War, to then start seeing uh, the, 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 the freeing of, of slaves. And once again, economic principles were more important than moral principles. So not only did some governments pay slave owners to release their slaves. They were actually paid. But also some slaves had to pay their way out to, to freedom. So it's just amazing. So we're, we're talking about anything up to a million slaves at this time uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the United States. So the land, the, 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 if to understand modern day economies, industrial economies, one is to understand how goods and services start from raw material, mass production of raw materials, such as sugar, tobacco, cotton, uh, uh, cocoa, and so on, coffee. Raw material is mass produced and then mass manufactured, processed, to make it possible for mass consumption across society. This is the very basis of the contribution by African slaves. They were the very basis of the massification of the industrial process. Large-scale specialized production of these commodities, making it possible for the U.S. to introduce a higher level of manufacturing prowess, also accelerating the pace of market-oriented production in Europe, because at that time, Europe was still basically also uh, uh, in a state where most of Africa is today with non-market-oriented production. So slavery did provide that uh, raw material needed for this industrial transformation. And because of the relationship between the United States and Europe, that transatlantic trade and interaction 
uh, between the UK and its colonies was the starting point, the, the, the foundation of what we today understand as the global economy. But yeah, economic necessity still trumps morality even today. Uh, I mean, then it was the same. The whites would be politically divided. Uh, 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 but they would still all defend slavery, you know, because it, 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 it gave all white superiority, you know. So even the churches, uh, southern churches became supporters of slavery, just like the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa defended apartheid. So the greatest direct contribution of slaves to the world economy came in especially in the mega product called cotton, which is by far the most significant industrial commercial crop over the last 400 years. And during its height uh, with slaves in plantations, the United States provided, the cotton provided more than 50% of all export earnings of the United States. So, that concludes uh, 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 my analysis on how Africa and African slaves were direct contributors to the crafting of modern day economy to, the, to allow the United States to be the economic superpower of the world started with the South with that mass production of mega value chains, especially cotton, as well as tobacco, uh, 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 you know, sugar and, and other crops. What we see today with the dominance of the US economies uh, then superseding United Kingdom and eventually that US, Europe, industrial trade uh, axis being able to dominate the rest of the world economy up until today. Thank you and see you shortly in closing. So in conclusion, I mean, Africa and African slaves were at the center of how the modern world economy was crafted and how it works today, you know, this is how you begin to understand the contribution by Africa to modern day capitalism. You know, the, uh, I explained also earlier and now in conclusion that that whole economic transformation of the South of the Confederacy, how it made it possible to see the growth of a modern economy. This is how you know the contribution of slavery, because when you see how the key sectors of the financial services sector grew, finance, insurance, real estate, it all started with the massive uh, 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 expansion of raw material production, manufacturing, and massification of the, the economy and making it possible for the uh, plantation owners and the millionaires to contribute to a really uh, serious growth in the financial services sector. So, in conclusion, also, I would then want to go back to Jeff Pierce, the author to The Gifts of Africa. And say this from Jeff Pierce. The worst, the Western world, is to begin to understand Africa and only do so when it realizes that it's not talking to a child, it's actually talking to its mother. And what we have covered today is important for brand Africa because the proverbial mother that the West talks down to is the one who taught 
the West. True values of humanity, not it's almost it's 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 Mother Africa talking to a self-righteous teenager uh, in the West, and yet it is the Africans and African slaves who eventually brought the greatest gifts to the United States: the ethics of work, uh, worship, uh, family organization, uh, music. Food, you know, soul food, uh, play music, fashion, dance. Ultimately, it is the African Americans who have tried hardest to bring back humanity and how to be human back in the Western system. So, I would still argue, brand Africa should therefore based on modernizing those values rather than westernizing them. Brand Africa should exude a motherly people, mother to the rest of the world, not its, its child. Uh, Brand Africa should exude workmanship, humanity, a family and community. Uh, a, a brand. Africa should be a breath of fresh air that is missing now in the whole world, which is at all uh, at war on everything. It should be a breath of fresh air through its uplifting effect on humanity. At the end of it all, we come back to the point: whoever controls Africa and Africa brand will run the world. So. African society is going to be the most dominant in numbers and economy in the second half of this century. So we better get that bread right now uh, before we sleepwalk into greatness. By 2050, just at the half of the century, one in every five human beings will be African. And by the end of the century, two out of five humans will be African. We better be ready to take on the responsibility uh, of the largest economy uh, and the largest population after China. Uh, and, 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 and we'll see where India is going to be. But brand Africa can only be recrafted by Africans based on African values and heritage and uh, Africans' pursuit of human experience. Most importantly is the African world view rather than the material world view. The African world view has to come through, especially by the time Africa is the dominant population and dominant people in the world. African world view has, has, has to save humanity, how to be human, how to maintain mutual respect across religions, ethnic groups, political views, uh, mutual benefit in the way we use especially natural resources uh, because uh, it's very clear that uh, personalizing especially uh, the natural resources such as clean air uh, and abundant forests and clean water is, is not something that is sustainable. You know, mutual responsibility and accountability not this half-baked United Nations system, which, 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 which is uh, basically based on uh, what I call boarding school uh, philosophy. The bullies can always veto uh, 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 any issues that could save humanity because you've got nuclear weapons. Okay. The future world cannot survive like that. So this is who we are as Africans. And the answers to that journey lie within Africa. In fact, including answers to some of the global challenges too. These are the highest values that I'm talking about in this brand. The same values that will see us create a great future for Africa and the world. Peace, prosperity, uh, freedom. Thank you very much. See you at the next session.